I'll tell you who I am. My name is Thomas McEvely. I'm the chairperson of the Department of Art Criticism and Writing at the School of Visual Arts. And it's my great privilege to be able to introduce to you the first speaker on our critics lecture series this year. We started this series last year and I think we had a very distinguished group of lecturers and uh, tonight I'm proud and happy to be able to announce that my old colleague and friend Donald Cuspit will address us. A pleasure and privilege to introduce you to Donald Cuspit. Thank you, Tom. Let there be light. It's always a pleasure to work with Tom. Uh, we've known each other since we were both involved at Art Forum with um, Ingrid Sishi. And uh, then Tom was the uh, editor. Can we have total light? Uh, there'll be some slides lately. I like total light. Thank you. So I can see who's, who my friends and antagonists are. Um, and uh, I uh, have always ad uh, admired Tom's work. I published a volume of his in a series I edit for Cambridge University Press. And while we disagree about what's significant and what's not in art, um, still, I think, very much respect him. I incidentally have to say I've never thought of journalistic criticism as trivial in any way. I think it's often very informative. And also, I have to just say that I really don't like the word critic, art critic. I think of it, uh, what I'm doing is essentially bringing to bear critical consciousness on this phenomenon called art. In other words, it's an extension of an intellectual analysis of it. All right, let me get to my topic. Uh, Ruth Ann Friedenthal, an artist friend who's sitting next to me, says, typical cusp topic, provocative and strange. Um, I had wanted to show you two slides to start it off, uh, both by Jasper Johns, um, early pieces, one called The Critic Smiles and the other called The Critic Sees. Uh, these slides seem to have disappeared. Uh, from the collection. Somebody has them out for a year. Very hard to get. But it's easy to tell you uh, what they're about. Uh, they show uh, eyeglasses uh, embedded uh, in a sort of uh, uh, metal. Uh, it's a found object and these eyeglasses look a little sinister and Mr. Johns clearly didn't like it. I can tell you something that I remember John Copeland's told me when he was the editor of uh, Art Forum in the 70s. Uh, which is when I first began writing for them, uh, he said there's nothing that Johns does that isn't full of contempt. And uh, these images uh, convey contempt. And that's a direct quote from Johns, uh, from, from Copeland. I always remember this. This is a curious piece. Um, I keep on file um, two kinds of records. I have uh, remarks by uh, artists disparaging critics, and I have remarks by artists disparaging other artists. They happen to be more of the latter than the former. And these are historical records. And this increases particularly in the modern period, interesting, which is a period of abundance of art writing. Uh, as you all know, big fat volumes of manifestos, statements, assertions, insults, and so forth. And I became acutely aware as time went on that this was a very rich uh, material. And being an art critic and having had my fair share of knocks from artists, I thought, well, let's try to put this together and understand this complicated relation between critic and artist. And so this paper is an effort to do it um, from a variety of points of view, but it will introduce uh, psychoanalytic ideas. I do teach art and psychoanalysis, and I do feel there's a rich fund of information uh, about art, ideas and information about art that uh, analysts have given us and that is barely known in the art world except in rather superficial form or in uh, orthodox and uh, rather truncated Lacanian form. In any case, um, let me go forward and I will signal when I'm using an analytic idea and if there's any problems we can discuss it but I think I'm going to try to be clear and translate this into ordinary English. Many, and I emphasize many, I will show you uh, works later on, uh, but they will be to illustrate certain particular points. Many, and I emphasize many, not all, artists dislike critics. In fact, nobody likes critics. They're carping, sarcastic, and envious of their creative betters. Uh, 
to use a few of the insults hurled at them. They spoil the fun of art, as though art was good, innocent fun. A history of such dislike can, in fact, be traced from the beginning of modern art to the present day, which I will do for you. The issue is what this tells us about the artist as well as critic, ideally a kind of twinship, perhaps in Heinz Kohut's sense, an important psychoanalyst, but in practice rarely reciprocal. Another issue is how the critic deals with the artist's dislike of him, unless, of course, he can be of use to the artist. To ask this another way, what emotional as well as social position does the artist's negative attitude put the critic in? So this is really more about being a critic than being an artist in a sense. Theoretically, the critic may be the artist's ideal self-object. Self-object is a term that Coate uses. He argues, just as we can't live without objects, uh, without oxygen, we can't live without self-objects. These are objects that become part of ourselves. The perfect patient mirror, raising no questions about what is reflected in it. But in emotional practice, this is far from the case. Their needs diverge for cognitive as well as emotional reasons. Nonetheless, one can't be discussed without the other, for they depend on each other. The critic's dependence on the artist is much noted. The artist's dependence on the critic is less noted, even overlooked. Like everyone else, the artist needs emotional support, and the critic is optimally the source of that support. The ideal critic would be someone the artist can turn to whenever he needs emotional refueling, a term used by Margaret Mahler, a limitless cornucopia of kindness, consideration, encouragement, and nourishment. In other words, the bountiful good breast, as Klein would put it. But I am talking of a deeper, more fundamental need. Art supposedly transcends the conditions that created it, but it can never transcend its critical condition in the medical as well as philosophical sense of that term. The critic represents that problematic condition, for better or worse, and in fact has the fate of the artist in his or her hands. The artist knows, however unconsciously, that the critic has this power, the power of recognition and reception, as it had been called by the German theorist Hans Robert Jaus, the developer of the aesthetics of reception, or the power of the receiver reader, as it has been called by Umberto Eco, the great semiotician which is why he despises him, sometimes quite consciously, as a threat to the future of his art and more broadly to his sense of entitlement. As Gladys and Kurt Lang, two great scholars, make clear in their brilliant book, Etched in Memory, The Building and Survival of Artistic Reputation, the critic in his role as publicity agent and advocate for an art not only helps create its market, 19th century prints in their case study, but seems to guarantee its posterity by making it memorable, that is, inscribing it in collective memory, where it survives as a critical artistic trace. As Baudelaire wrote in the Salon of 1846, I quote him, how many artists today owe to the critics alone their sad little fame, close quote. Clement Greenberg's assertion, of course, critics don't matter now, only collectors do, right? Uh, critic Clement Greenberg's assertion that he can find much to damn in an art while admiring it does not exactly endear him to the artist nor does his attack on what he called his term art adoration, and on the belief that the artist is, I quote Greenberg again, a prodigy of nature whose activity does not brook the weighing, qualifying, and comparing proper to criticism, close quote. Criticism, he says, I quote, attempts to place his art in relation to other art, and this, close quote, and this place changes with every change in critical perspective as well as in the history of art. Greenberg is interested in the situation or context of art as much as he is in any particular art, and while celebrating the significance of many artists, he swears allegiance to none. For him, every art is subject to reevaluation, suggesting that its value is never assured, let alone absolute. A gradual consensus may evolve around it, as he said, but the consensus may be challenged, and in fact, as Adorno argued, always is by the movement of history and thought. There are no unequivocal winners, an artist or thinker who rises above criticism as though immune to it in either. But the narcissistic artist does not want differentiated appreciation. He wants blind endorsement, total unconditional love, recognition, acceptance. For the grandiose artist, there is no other art but his own 
however much he acknowledges his debt to other artists, usually dead and out of the way, rather than alive and competitive, and even to philosophical ideas and critical thought. Indeed, many artists have paid homage to Greenberg's ideas, as well as the power to advance their careers. Here are some statements of dislike, not to say dismissive disdain, abusive hatred, and annihilative depreciation by modern artists. I'm quoting to you now from the Technical Manifesto of Futurist Painting, published April 11, 1910, one of the leading documents of futurism. Art critics are useless or harmful, it states without further ado or explanation. Seemingly more reason, Gauguin writes in a letter to the critic André Fontenas, March 1899, who wrote an eloquent, supportive, analytic review of an exhibition of his paintings, I quote Gauguin, criticism of today, when it is serious, intelligent, full of good intentions, tends to impose on us a method of thinking and dreaming which might become another bondage, preoccupied with what concerns it, particularly its own field, literature, it will lose sight of what concerns us, painting. If that is true, this is continuing the quote from Gauguin, I shall be impertinent enough to quote Mallarmé. And here's the quote from Mallarmé. A critic is someone who meddles with something that is none of his business, close quote. There is clearly something offensive as well as defensive in this, and also something theoretical. Criticism is a species of literature, that is, it's verbal, Painting, visual, is not literature. Elsewhere, Gauguin spends a fair amount of time arguing for the superiority of painting over literature, and never the twain shall meet. They are essentially incommensurate, which, clear, which certainly insulates painting from criticism. But even Mallarmé, a literary figure, dismisses criticism. The literary critic is, by definition, not as creative as the poet. And here we're getting closer to what I want to talk about. Later, in a letter to Charles Maurice, written July 1901, Gauguin presents, quote, the classical reason for the avant-garde artist rejection of criticism. I'm quoting Gauguin. Can we have the first slide now, perhaps? Thank you. Why is it, and I'm quoting Gauguin, why is it that before a work, the critic wants to make points of comparison with former ideas and with other authors, that is, other artists? And I'm going to give you an example of doing this. This is Gauguin's famous Spirit of the Dead Watching, which is in the Albright Knox. Now this is on exhibit in this fantastic exhibition by Ambroise Vallard in the uh, Met. And Vallard, uh, a collector, a, a dealer, and a collector, uh, and like all curators, a critic as well. And here I show you, take you back several centuries, a number of centuries. And this is the famous Creeping Eve, so to say, in St. Lazare, Autonne about 1125-35 by Giselbertus, one of the few signed works we have from that period, and it's an example of primitivism, okay, and I'm deliberately going far afield from Gauguin, but I'm sure that he knew this piece. And uh, continuing the quote from Gauguin, and not finding what he believes, that is what the critic believes should be there, he comprehends no more and he is not moved. Emotion first, understanding later, famous statement by Gauguin. Thus the cliché, the critic thinks before he feels, if he has any feeling, or as a psychoanalyst might say, he intellectualizes the art, precluding its becoming an intense emotional experience. He does this because he defends, according to Gauguin, established art and norms, and thus is closed to new ideas, that is, he is committed to tradition rather than avant-garde innovation. He protects what is socially and institutionally objectified as art, dismissing any challenges to it as error. Gauguin once wrote the following, in every art there are only two types of people, revolutionaries and plagiarists, and in the end, doesn't the revolutionary's work become official once the state takes it over, the state for him meaning the Louvre. Okay. He consciously thought of himself as a revolutionary, but may have unconsciously felt that he was a plagiarist, an imposter, as it were. If the critic uncovered his debt to tradition, that is, past, past authors, that is, the continuity of his art with the art and ideas of the past, for example, Gauguin's unmistakable debt to Christian iconography, I give you one example out of many, 
Uh, this is uh, Iana, Ia, Ia Orana Maria, We Greet Thee Mary, uh, 1891. Uh, it's a museum on art, and it shows the almost inescapable influence of Christian art on all these people, in the, all these artists in the Met show. Okay, uh, transpose a Christian scene, transpose to Tahiti, to an exotic scene. Okay, also to stained glass windows. Uh, again, this famous work, which is in the Boston Museum of Fine Arts, uh, is now in the Met on this, in this exhibition. Whence come we? What are we? Whither go we? Uh, and it's based on cloisonné and uh, influence of cloisonné or stained glass. Um, this has been well documented as many of his other works are. Okay, uh, so uh, we have also involved a romantic belief in the healing power of the exotic, okay, or the primitive, if you want to call it that. Thus, because of all these t debts and ties to the past, uh, the fraudulence of his self-proclaimed revolutionariness would become apparent. It would be another narcissistic lie, not a radical alteration of our consciousness of art. And however much Gauguin despised the state as the symbol of the conventions and outlook he was trying to overthrow, he implicitly wanted to be endorsed by the state, for without its imprimatur, his work would not be officially art. He wanted social success, and this is quite explicit if you read his many writings, as much as he wanted critical recognition as an avant-garde rebel, and he cultivated uh, many critics, perhaps most famously Aurier, who unfortunately died young and really gave us the basic program of symbolism. Uh, thus he was in conflict. Gauguin wanted to be appropriated and assimilated, but realized that if he was, and he assumed he eventually would be, his art would lose its revolutionary cachet exchanging it for social appeal. The critic is the instrument of this appropriation and assimilation even as he threatens it. He is the gatekeeper of the establishment, as it were, and Gauguin wanted to get through the gate, even though he despised the establishment. Thus, with one hand, he dismisses critics, um, this is all quotation from Gauguin, as watching over artistic security and keeping a sharp outlook for contraband talent close quote from Gauguin, such as his own. And with the other hand, he eagerly engages critics, ostensibly to explain himself, but also to win their approval, and thus entry into the pantheon of the state museum, the Louvre. He never compromised his ideas, but he was psychosocially compromised to begin with. As though elaborating on Gauguin's ideas about critics, Kandinsky wrote in an essay on the problem of form in 1912, I close quote, uh, I, I uh, quote from Gauguin, uh, from Kandinsky, one, never, one may never believe a theoretician, art historian, critic, and so forth, when he asserts that he has discovered some objective mistake in the work. The only thing which the theoretician can justifiably assert is that he has, until now, not yet become familiar with this or that use of the means. The theoreticians who find fault with the work or praise it starting with the analysis of the forms which have already existed are the most harmful misleaders. They form a wall between the work and the naive observer, close quote. In other words, if one tracked the religious dimension and the great debt again to Christianity in Kandinsky, we would be missing the point. So I'm just gonna show you a few of his many, many images of churches. This is the Ludwigskirche uh, in Munich. Uh, that he painted in 1908. It's on the way to his total abstraction. Uh, then he did the church in Murnau. This is a little faded, to say the least, in 1909. Okay, and then what do we make of this comparison? Everybody says that the Blue Rider was an idea that he and Franz Marc uh, came up with uh, many years later, but this is a work called the Blue Rider, 1903, and then 1911, we have Another writer, notice the change in style, but it's the same principle. And I suggest to you that all these writers go back to a very famous religious motif, St. George in the Wood. And here we see the famous Altdorfer, a wonderful little piece in the Munich Alta Pinakothek in 1910, uh, where the uh, saint is on his horse, uh, and uh, the horse is made blue later, the blue of the sky, transcendental blue, and he's going after the dragon. And this is uh, one of the marvelous examples of Danube School uh, painting, really great piece. Okay, 
and I think you can track this whole iconographic and even handling motive back right here to right here. Love me or leave my art alone. Oh, excuse me, let me, let me finish my quote here. It should be noted that such analysis involving examination of the influence on the art's formation and development undermines its claims to uniqueness. Indeed, the myth of miraculous creation ex nihilo, which Kandinsky wants for himself. Kandinsky concludes from this standpoint, which unfortunately is mostly the only one possible, the art critic is the worst enemy of art privileged position to be the worst one, close quote. Love me or leave my art alone, Kandinsky suggests, following in the footsteps of Gauguin and Mallarmé. Or, more extremely, better a naive, uncritical, not to say mindless viewer than a sophisticated, attentive mind. He wants the naive viewer, the primitive, the innocent. Kandinsky would rather be idolized, he did have a messianic complex, as we know, than understood. Art lends itself to idolatry, but the individual critic is not an idolater. Indeed, he tends to be an idol breaker, which is why Kandinsky prefers the gullible, idol-worshipping masses to him. But all is not lost, and we can shut this now and maybe have the lights on again. There is indeed an ideal critic for Kandinsky, and he strongly resembles Gauguin's emotional critic. I'm quoting Kandinsky now. The ideal critic would not be the critic who would need, seek to discover the mistake, aberrations, ignorance, plagiarisms, and so forth, but the one who would seek to feel, that's Kandinsky's emphasis, how this or that form has an inner effect, its inner necessity, as he called it, and would then impart expressively his whole experience to the public, in effect becoming the artist's spokesperson. This critic, Kandinsky adds, I quote, would need the soul of a poet since the poet must feel objectively in order to embody his feeling subjectively. In other words, another artist, a literary artist, uh, could only appreciate and be a true critic of uh, visual art. That is, the critic, continuing the quote from Kandinsky, the critic would have to possess a creative power. In reality, however, critics, this is Kandinsky, and this famous remark, critics are very unsuccessful artists who are frustrated by the lack of their own creative power and therefore called upon to direct the creative power of others. And the ultimate insult here, close quote. This put down clincher is another stupid cliche. The critic is a failed artist. This prejudice is like a teacher is a, a, a failed artist as well, this idea. Uh, the, this prejudiced, pernicious cliche is echoed in unthinking psychoanalytic form by a great analyst Franz Alexander, who spoke of analysis of corrective emotional experience. He wrote in 1940, I quote, often he has a more, the critic that is, has a more critical than creative mind, notice the distinction between critical and creative, and unconsciously resents the genius's creative capacity, notice the myth of the genius there. And should he himself possess a productive intellect and have ambitions for originality, he might feel envious, envy, a very basic emotion, as uh, Melanie Klein argues, uh, envy makes the world go round, not love, as we know. He might feel envious of the giant with whom he is unable to compete. Notice that the genius, the artist, is automatically a giant, which makes the critic a midget, close quote. This stereotype distinction, it is not dissimilar to the hierarchical distinction between art and craft, more particularly the visionary artist, that is what Jung calls the artist who has, I quote, Jung primordial vision, close quote, and the humble craftsman, a mere maker of artifacts, which however exquisite lack this primordiality, appears in different form in a book by Lucy Jo Palladino titled The Edison Trait, Saving the Spirit of Your Nonconforming Child. Chapter two on, quote, children who are divergent thinking dominant, this book is by a psychologist and art therapist, opens with the section, Can Critics Learn to Create? as though people who can create don't have to learn to be critical. The hackneyed orthodox distinction between creative artist and uncreative critic also survived in perhaps the only psychoanalytic article that directly addresses the psychology of the critic. In what is admittedly speculative, the Freudian psychoanalyst Philip Weissman writes, quote, 
that the childless state of the critic may extend from his personal to his artistic self. Biographies of critics should be studied to reveal the nature of their Oedipal complex, certainly artists also. One solution which might be predicted is the surrender of their own pre procreative wishes, which would then permit them to be both curious about and aggressively critical of their creative parents, as though the artist was a creative parent. In other words, they are an angry witness to the artist's inner primor, primal scene. For the uh, primal scene is the analytic idea for uh, the fantasy you have of what your parents are doing when they're having sexual intercourse, usually violently abusing one another. For the Kleinian psychoanalyst, leading Kleinian analyst, Hannah Siegel, quote, in the genital position, as distinct from the pregenital position, the artistic creation is felt to be a baby resulting from meaningful internal intercourse. And determined, the, supposedly the critic would then uh, be an angry witness to this kind of scene and determined to stop it, even to annihilate the parental couple of the artist's internal world. That's quotes. Well, maybe. Certainly this fits in with the literary critic Leon Adel's remark in an essay on literary criticism and psychoanalysis that, quote, from the psychoanalytic point of view, I suppose, it might be said that criticism is often founded on a fund of aggressivity. Close quote. The psychoanalyst Barris assumption that the biographer displaces his unconscious feelings of aggression onto the subject of the biography presumably applies pari passu to the critic. But the point is that Weissman and Adel mechanically assume that criticism is not creative. Also, they make the fundamental error of not realizing there's always a positive libidinous component. Uh, there's always ambivalence. The prominent English psychoanalyst Donald Meltzer, leading figure in um, the British object relational figure in his book called The Apprehension of Beauty has the same problem. After adulating artists, quote, their pained perception of the inhumanities daily in force about them, as though other people don't have pained perception of the inhumanity of our world, juxtaposed to a vision of the beauty of the world being vandalized by these primitive social processes forbids them to squander the huge blocks of lifetime required for adaptation. Okay, then Melzer, after doing this, saying this positive about us, attacks what he calls the recent vogue in literary criticism, and we know who he's going after, the French critics, among others, as a precise example of acting out ambivalence and hostility towards the artists. And there is this still on raging debate about the creativity of literary criticism. Uh, and just as equal to the creativity of the literary writer, and it's connected up with the death of the author idea. Uh, his remark, Melsa's remark about artists, strikes me as profoundly naive and about literary critics profoundly stupid, all the more so because in the next breath, he seems to suggest they are part of the plot to what he calls treat artists as members of the amusement industry, close quote. This is not only a gross misunderstanding of what Adorno and Horkheimer meant by the culture industry, and I would say the artist not only adapts to it consciously, but it unconsciously informs his mentality, leading him to produce work that fits in even when it seems unfitting, all the more so because its irreconcilability or transgressiveness, subversiveness, also has a predictable place in the administered society of which the culture industry is a branch, but also a gross misunderstanding of critical consciousness. It is by definition fundamentally different from one what, what one might call amusement consciousness or entertainment consciousness which pervades our society, although no doubt criticism administers the work by theorizing it, which hardly makes it amusing, thus suggesting that even critical theory can be an instrument of the administered society, however much avant-garde theory de-administers the work by showing that it escapes the usual categories, or at least seems to as much as avant-garde criticism does. To put the issue in Siegel's terms, these theorists can't even imagine that the critical creation also issues from meaningful internal intercourse. Thus, they take the artist's aggressive point of view, even as they are blind to his aggression, not only to the critic, but against other artists. They ignore what might be called the Hobbesian influence on creativity and innovation the war of all artists against all other artists, even when they temporarily cooperate for social purposes. This is quite obvious in many statements by avant-garde artists, we can go all the way back to Malevich, 
For example, to take something more recently, Judd's notorious attack on Picasso, Mondrian, Basilitz, in Kia in a two-part article in Art in America in the early 80s where he was terrorized, traumatized by the reemergence of painting and expressionism and figuration. Renato Poggioli, in his famous book, The Theory of the Avant-Garde, points out that such attacks, which are a commonplace of the avant-garde artist's attitude, demonstrate what Poggioli calls the antagonism, which is one of the basic moments, as he calls it, uh, of avant-gardism, basic to the avant-gardist approach to art. Anyone who does not conform to one's position is automatically decadent, retarded, tear, and wrong-headed. Everyone who does is automatically advanced, progressive, and right-thinking. The myth of progress of, in art is basic to avant-garde self-belief. Now, Oscar Wilde seriously and convincingly disagrees with this. Indeed, argues that the critic is more creative than the artist. No doubt one of Wilde's overstatements, but one to the creative critical point. I will later get to Wilde's idea that the work of criticism is an even profounder creation than the work of art. Ironically, Weissman's assertion that, I quote, the expert critic must have a higher sensibility than the artist to the interrelatedness of stimuli suggests as much, close quote. Thus, the critic does not exactly identify with the artist, as is usually assumed. Weissman points out that excessive identifications, over-hostile or over-loving, and this is everywhere in life, um, are as hazardous uh, for the artist as for the critic, but, as Wilde points out, uses him the way the artist aggressively as well as libidinously uses his model, creatively transforming and analytically subsuming the artist's work in his own synthesis of art, thought, and what Donald Winnicott, analyst, calls creative apperception, which gives life to both. Like artistic transformation, critical transformation is, in Umberto Eco's words, an uncanny mix of fidelity to and freedom from the model, be it external or internal. Or, to use Baudelaire's conception of imagination, the critical imagination, like the artistic imagination, is, quoting Baudelaire, both analysis and synthesis, for it decomposes its object and creates a new world out of the raw materials. In the process, making the object, the work of art in the critic's case, some subject matter model in the artist's case, including art as its own subject matter, seems new. In the language of the psychoanalyst Donald Winnicott's potential space, the critic both finds and creates the work, creating into it, great idea, creating into, never just creating, creating into something to help it find itself. To stretch the psychoanalyst Wilfred Bion's language, another important figure, Kleinian, the critic makes the work available for understanding by elaborating it, thus allowing it to be stored in memory rather than expelled as an alien material, unbearable perhaps because of the unbearably raw feelings it threatens to arouse. In other words, the critic contains the novel work by performing the so-called alpha function, this term that Bion uses, moving beyond his own initial tendency to subject it to a paranoid schizoid analysis, that is destructive analysis, toward a kind of depressive accommodation to an assimilation of it. I'm playing with Klein's distinction between the paranoid schizoid and depressive positions. The avant-garde, which we go through back and forth in life, the avant-garde or revolutionary critic inclines to the former, the establishment critic to the latter. A superb example of paranoid schizoid criticism is Baudelaire's ironical remark to his friend Manet that Manet's art was, I quote Baudelaire, the best of a bad lot, close quote. If this is ambivalence, it expands the horizons of perception, showing that at its best it is inherently dialectical. So is ambivalence, which is a way of grasping the structure of opposition within what seems self-same indicating that self-identity is a social illusion. For Baudelaire, realism was a failure of imagination and is such decadent. I think it's a mistake to say that, but anyway, I'll quote him on this. In contrast, the establishment critic, usually art historically aware, appears to demonstrate that all art plagiarizes other art. I'm playing on Gauguin's idea, however implicitly, that there is no unconditionally new art, only endless variations of old art. And this makes all art subliminally depressing. Neither Gauguin nor Kandinsky could tolerate either avant-garde or establishment criticism, 
each of which is dialectical in its own critical way. Both link the work, and I'm using linking in beyond sense, beyond who work with psychotics argued their main problem was they couldn't link two thoughts together. It was broken, so they thought fragmentarily. Brion sensed that as the basic task of consciousness, or as the psychoanalyst, contemporary psychoanalyst, very important figure, Peter Fonagy, these are all British, uh, calls it the mentalization that is fundamental to consciousness. Well, what the, the, the both types of critics do is they link the particular work they're dealing with to other works as well as art history, socio-cultural history, and intellectual history, thus giving it greater credibility that is a more meaningful and so more, more memorable identity than it would have standing alone and apart as though it was self-identical, even self-generating. Both avant-garde and establishment criticism bring into question the cliche that a picture is worth a thousand words. Perhaps the best known put down of the critic by an artist was made by Friedrich Schiele, whom Freud quotes in the interpretation of dreams with what seems to be approval even though psychoanalysis is a mode of critical thought. I'm quoting Schiller now. You worthy critics, or whatever you may call yourself, you can see the contempt in that, are ashamed or afraid, and of course he was a great critic himself, are ashamed or afraid of the momentary and passing madness which is found in all real creators. This is sort of close to the beginning of modernism, clearly. The longer or shorter duration of which distinguishes the thinking artist from the dreamer." Close quote. Since antiquity, the artist has always been regarded as subliminally mad, a victim of what the Greeks called enthusiasmos, that is possession by a god, that's the derivation of our term enthusiasm, a kind of madness, mania, because it was beyond, another Greek word, was beyond reason, and as such peculiarly superior to ordinary uninspired mortals. But here's another more contemporary put down of the critic. Indeed, a kind of disgusting, a disgusted bristling at him. And this is my favorite anti-critic quotation. In Samuel Beckett's Waiting for Godot, there's the following exchange. Vladimir, moron, estragon. That's the idea. Let's abuse each other. They turn, move apart, turn again, and face each other. Vladimir, moron, estragon. Vermin, Vladimir, abortion, estragon, morpion, Vladimir, sewer rat, estragon, curate. You've got to be Irish to appreciate that one. <laughs> Vladimir, cretin, estragon, with finality, critic. <laughs> Vladimir, oh, he wilts, vanquished, and turns away. <laughs> End of the quote from Beckett. Okay. Presumably, the critic is a moron, vermin, and sewer rat, cretin, etc., wrapped in one abortion. <laughs> Why such heroic insults against an anti-hero? Why bother to destroy what is already regarded as harmless and ridiculous? Well, W.S. Gilbert, of Gilbert and Sullivan fame, gave up being a critic. He was a very important music critic, which is not well known. And I'm quoting why his reason why he gave up being a critic, because he did not like being hated, which was the doom of any critic who told the truth." Close quote. And that's Gilbert's own words. Babcock, another analyst, notes that the intuitions of the critic, and it's a quote, the intuitions of the critic sometimes touch on ignored factors, close quote. God forbid that the critic should discover the secret of the work. No return of the repressed for the artist, at least not in the critic's consciousness. Artists want to control the interpretation of their work. Alternate interpretations, particularly those that see something in the work that the artist doesn't see or doesn't want to see, must be discredited and slandered. This is part, in part done by dismissing the critic as a fool, but then Lear's fool was wise, certainly wiser than Lear. I have myself, just to give you two personal anecdotes, been derided by certain artists for interpretations they dislike. One woman artist wrote an article saying I ought to be squashed like a bug for something I wrote about her, which is now being reprinted in a catalog of her work because she thought it was very good. Now, this is about 15 years later, okay. Uh, and another, this was all in public, incidentally, and another artist, a male artist, a very famous one, tried to run me over in his car because I became critical of some of his work. This is right on Sixth Avenue. Uh, 
Um, and fortunately, I have a, can see in the back of my head. Uh, critics have to do that. Okay. Uh, even though they offered no alternative interpretations, there was no counter argument. And all criticism worth the name is a kind of argument, thus precluding dialogue by what is clearly authoritarian censorship, not to say anti-intellectualism. Of course, being treated with violent contempt by these artists does not necessarily uh, make me wise, but since they never bother to explain the error of my interpretive ways, I may have been on to something. Okay, I obviously hit a nerve. Hiding behind their righteous indignation, they ended up tongue-tied in rage and anti-intellectualism, which suggests their one-dimensionality. More to the point, I think, is the philosopher George Santayana's statement that, I quote, I think it's a very important statement, all criticism is moral since it deals with benefits and their relative weight. It is a serious and public function. It shows the race assimilating, that is the human race, assimilating the individual, dividing the mortal from the immortal part of the individual, close quote. And that's just the point. The artist is in terror of this seemingly last judgment. He is afraid that his art may not be immortal. As Otto Rank famously wrote in his book, Art and Artists, the ultimate ambition of the artist is to become immortal by making an immortal work of art. But by its very nature, criticism cannot grant, even withholds immortality, which is in any case a narcissistic illusion, indeed the grandest of narcissistic illusions, really. It's, it's uh, an extension, basically, of fame, which, as Milton said, is the last infirmity of noble mind. The artist idealizes his work of art. Immortalization is a form of idealization, and anyone who threatens that idealization is suspect. In other words, the artist is heavily invested in his work. Anyone who brings into intellectual question what is emotionally unquestionable for the artist is the enemy of his art. Critical consciousness is experienced as inherently skeptical and inhibiting. The word critical means skepticism. It's rooted in skepticism, critical thinking, as we say. And it echo evokes the artist's unconscious self-doubt, denied in the name of the undoubted immortality of his work. The work is a moonshot to immortality, but if there's anything wrong with the art rocket, it won't reach the moon. And the critic invariably finds something wrong with it, namely, that it is a part of its mortal times, even as he finds what's right with it, that is, what is enduring or likely to be continuing of continuing interest in it, that is, it's a mortal part. Separating the nourishing wheat from the worthless chaff, the critic threatens the integrity of the work. Through the critic, the artist discovers the ambivalence of his own love for his art, a self-recognition he would rather do without, for it undermines his blind narcissistic faith in himself. Siegel writes that, I quote, from a narcissistic position, the artistic product is put forward, narcissistic is a pregenital position, is put forward as self-created feces with a constant terror that one's product will be revealed as shit. That's her quote. And the critic forces the artist back on the narcissistic position, at least in the artist's own mind, and makes him suspect and fear that what he has produced is shit. That is, that it does not, I quote, Klein, have a life of its own and one which will survive the artist, close quote. Thus, the symbolic recreation, which is the way analysts think of works of art, is no longer a psychic act, but a physical farce. farce. And in fact, the critic does show that the artistic product is in part psychic and social shit, that is mortal, in the act of finding its seemingly immortal component. Thus, the critic is in an unenviable position. But he's also radically free, in the psychoanalyst Eric Fromm's sense of the term, in a situation in which people are reluctant to think freely and critically because of a variety of social and commercial pressures. Critical consciousness is the last stand of freedom, as Adorno and Horkheimer write, which must be sustained, in part to sustain genuine individuality and integrity, even though it may have no historical effect, that is, make no social difference, as they argue. Even the artist wants to escape from his own freedom by dogmatizing his style, turning it into a brand, thus locking himself in a Procrustean social and self-understanding, 
which slowly, slowly but surely erodes and destroys the dialectics of nuance in the psychoanalyst and philosopher Victor von Weizsäcker's sense of that term that is the wellspring of his creativity. The artist's contempt for the critic, the artist displacing onto the critic his fear that his art may be shit and thus be flushed away by time, instead the critic becomes shit, is an opportunity for emotional and cognitive freedom and autonomy. The artist's persecutory attempt, contempt is liberating once its shock is worked through. The critic must have the ego strength to not allow himself to be crushed by it. The real shock or trauma is the artist's implicit demand that the critic limit his ideas to those the artist approves and inhibit his feelings to those that are generally sanctioned and thus likely to be appropriate or proper to the art, which generates a conflict in the critic. A secondary shock is caused by the artist's assumption of the inherent superiority of his art and himself to any understanding of it and any critic, a view that even Weissman shatters. And you can find this in T.S. Eliot and Hemingway, uh, Eliot giving a lot of footnotes, explanatory of the wasteland, finally remarks, well, there's always more interpretations, as though the work is infinitely open-ended, which it may or may not be, depending on what the future brings and critical thinking about it. Um, indeed, one might say that the artist's attempted negation of the critic is the necessary condition for truly free thinking. It liberates the critic from internalizing the authority of the artist and from the social compulsion to conform, to submit his critical consciousness to public opinion and the artist's opinion. It leads him to trust his spontaneity more than ever without abandoning his knowledge of art, intellectual and cultural history thus achieving a new integration of mind and emotion, and with that, a new experience of art. It makes the critic truly original in Fromm's sense of the term. Fromm writes, I quote, this substitution of pseudo acts for original acts of thinking, feeling, and willing leads eventually to the replacement of the original self by a pseudo self. The original self is the self which is the originator of mental activities. The pseudo-self is only an agent who actually represents the role a person is supposed to play, but who does so under the name of the self. It is true that a person can play many roles and subjectively be convinced that he is he in each role. Actually, he is in all these roles what he believes he is expected to be. And for many people, if not most, the original self is completely suffocated by the pseudo-self." Close quote. This is from Escape from Freedom, one of his great books. In a sense, the critic needs the artist's rejection, the artist's attempt to annihilate him, to come into his own as a critic, assuming again that it does not disturb him more deeply than is necessary, that is, does not panic him however much distress it causes. It catalyzes his originality, making him more of an original self than ever that is, shifting the balance of psychic forces from pseudo-self to original self. Thus, he rises to the occasion of the artist's contempt or abuse by escaping from his pseudo-critical self, which submits to society's assumption about the critic's role, perhaps above all, the expectation that he will be subservient to the art, artist, and the status quo of art world opinion about both. One might say, using Winnicott's terms, that under the impact of the artist's attempt at dominance, the critic becomes more of a true creative self than a false compliant self, more ruthlessly and dynamically critical, one might say, and thus less passively accepting of the current gospel of art understanding. The original critic accepts fearless independence and freedom as his socially unfortunate, but intellectually and emotionally exciting and happy lot no longer, quote, repressed because of his fear of being ridiculed or attacked, close quote, that's from Fromm, uh, for his critical ideas, insights, and constructions, he sees ever more, he sees even more in the art, unraveling its implications, its inner structure, until it becomes clear that the art itself, at its creative best, is a critical construction, which is a point T.S. Eliot made uh, in Tradition and the Individual Talent, that famous essay. There is no question that the best art criticism involves the dialectical convergence as distinct from synth simplistic synthesis of the artist's original self and the critic's original self 
but there is also no question that this is usually rare because of the artist's own concern to fit into a certain trendy view of significant art and a certain trendy view of what is intellectually appropriate for legitimating and making his art culturally credible. So it's the artist's problem, perhaps more than the critic's. The critic becomes a hardy individualist in a situation of art group think, going against the conformist grain. His criticism may confirm existing opinion about an art, indeed give it a foundation and substance, but only after it has passed the test of his critical consciousness. He disbelieves in the inevitable immortality of art in a situation in which everyone else does, a situation in which a civilization expects to be remembered through its art. This unwittingly turns art into a memento mori. He has his identity apart from the art he investigates while the artist depends on art for his identity. Art may be a kind of religion, as Kandinsky and many others have said, but the critic is not particularly worshipful, however respectful he is of the artist's faith in himself and his ideas about his art, which amounts to a theoretical credo. Perhaps it is because the critic refuses to bend his knee at the altar of any one kind of art, but judges every art in terms of extra artistic as well as artistic standards, as Greenberg suggests, that the critic becomes the victim of hatred. The critic is by definition a skeptical Protestant rather than a believer in one true universal art faith, and many artists think that their art is the exemplary version of it. Indeed, if they did not, it would seem to lack a secure foundation and they would have no reason for making art apart from so-called self-expression, presumably therapeutic, if not exactly self-analytic. The psychoanalyst Michael Ballant, another important figure in British object relational thinking, writes that, quote, the ambivalently loved and idealized image must be preserved at all costs as a good and whole internal object. In such a state, any outside criticism whether justified or unfounded, merely mobilizes all the forces of the pent-up hatred and aggressiveness against the critic." Close quote. The artist protects himself, his ideal self-image and his view of his art as ideal, epitomized by the idea that it is immortal and deserving of absolute respect against the critic with all the aggression and resentment the artist can muster. The aggression and resentment are rooted in self-doubt, that is, threatened, even lost narcissistic confidence and the undermining self-doubt because the artist's doubt of the critic, that is his wish to undermine him. It is projected into the critic where it becomes the critic's imagined doubt of the work, not the analytic doubt inherent to critical consciousness, which is a sign of its freedom and spontaneity, but the expectation of the critic's automatically destructive response to the work. Thus, the critic becomes the scapegoat for the un artist's unconscious feeling of inadequacy when he cannot serve as the artist's ambassador to and buffer against an indifferent world. When the artist cannot call attention to the greatness of the art, he is blamed, that is, the critic is blamed for its lack of greatness. The artist negates the critic before the critic negates him, even if the critic doesn't negate him. The artist must negate the critic not only because no critic is ever good enough, which is why artists sort of accumulate critics, but because critical consciousness with its deconstructive dialectical methods, which uncover the contradictions that give the work its historical men momentum and unconscious appeal, and thus seem to dismantle it completely, and more simply because it situates the work in a larger context than that of its making, thus showing that it is not as privileged as it thinks and demonstrating that its immediacy is mediated, is by its nature disillusioning. The worst disillusion the artist can suffer is to realize that his work is, after all, however marvelously and carefully constructed, just an illusion, an illusion, a passing fancy, as it were. The artist doesn't want to wake from the dream of the work, that was Schiller's problem, but the critic insists on complete wakefulness as part of the condition of its appreciation. By the simple fact that the critic separates the mortal from the immortal part of the art, to refer back to Santayana, splits it, as it were, into bad and good parts. He seems to discuss the overall work of art. But for the critic, the value of art does not depend on its immortality, but on the emotional and cognitive experience it affords. Accepting its partial transience, he is able to enjoy it fully 
even as he evaluates it. Indeed, his enjoyment is part of his evaluation, and his evaluation is part of his enjoyment. He can discover what Stendhal calls the promise of happiness in it, even as he discovers its unhappy, self-contradictory state. Testing its qualities, he has a quality, he has a quality experience of it, however ironical that experience. He can approach it empathically without losing his mind because he approaches it in the spirit with which Freud approached the pleasure of looking at a beautiful flower in his essay on transience. However, transient, as Freud said, its beauty was intrinsically valuable. It's a very interesting essay, and in, in the, uh, the poet that is mentioned there is Rilke, uh, and this is on an outing that uh, Freud, Rilke, and Lou Andrea Salome, who was a student of Freud and who lived with Nietzsche at one point, uh, although probably there was no sex, and with Rilke where there was sex, um, Rilke was very unhappy that flowers decayed and he felt that sort of ruined them, and Freud thought, no, quite the contrary. Uh, it doesn't matter if it disappears, if it's mortal. Okay. I will both from the critic as artist and one from Paul Valéry's essay on Degas, dance and drawing. The first quotation makes clear the difference between what the artist creates and what the critic creates. The second suggests, with ironical wit, that the critic is ultimately more creative than the artist. The third suggests that criticism and creativity are essentially the same, in that they are interventions in discourse that attempt to refresh life, the most difficult of tasks. Wilde, arguing that, I quote Wilde, the highest kind of criticism treats the work of art simply as a starting point for a new creation and does not confine itself to discovering the real intention of the artist and accepting that as final. Quote, quote, he declares then, goes on, quote, the meaning of any, and this is the basis of modern criticism, the meaning of any beautiful thing is at least as much in the soul of him who looks at it as it was in his soul or psyche who wrought it. Nay, it is rather the beholder who lends to the beautiful thing its myriad meanings and makes it marvelous for us and sets it in some new relation to the age, the zeitgeist, so that it becomes a vital portion of our lives and a symbol of what we pray for, or perhaps of what, having prayed for, we fear that we may receive. Here is the second quotation. Speaking of the Mona Lisa, Wilde writes, do you ask me what Leonardo would have said had anyone told of this picture that all the thoughts and experience of the world are etched and molded therein, that which they had of power to refine and make expressive the outward form, the animalism of Greece, the lust of Rome, the reverie of the Middle Age with its spiritual ambition and imaginative loves, the return of the pagan world, the sins of the Borgias. He's referring to Pater's famous essay on Mona Lisa. Leonardo would probably have answered that he had contemplated none of these things, but he concerned himself simply with certain arrangements of lines and masses and with new and curious color harmonies of blue and green, close quote. I actually had an experience similar to this. I was once on a uh, panel uh, dealing with the work of a very prominent artificant beyond its means and execution and even form. Finally, Valerie. Valerie adds an important qualifier to Wilde's imaginary exchange. I quote Valerie, just as the thinker, think of the critic as a thinker, tries to defend himself from the platitudes and set phrases which protect the mind from surprise at everything and make practical living possible. So the painter can try by studying formlessness, or rather, singularity of form, to discover his own singularity, and with it...